Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Boy, you're wide awake this morning, and the cold weather hasn't even got here yet. But they tell us it's on its way, so I guess we better get ready for it, huh? Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Appreciate each one of you being here. Hope you've had a great week. Certainly has been a week of very, very beautiful weather. And God is blessed in many wonderful, wonderful ways, and we're thankful for that. So we gather together today to worship Him and give Him the praise and the glory that He is so deserving of. Let's be sure to do that as we uh, continue in our service. Enjoy the singing and uh, the sharing of God's precious Word and just rejoice in the Lord. Let's go together to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get right underway with the music. Father, thank you for your abundant blessings. We are truly, truly grateful for how you provide for us and how you meet all of our needs. We are grateful for this church family. We ask for your special blessings to be upon each and every one. We're thankful to see folks with us today that have been away because of having procedures done. And Lord, we are just grateful for how you have provided for them and may their healing process continue to go very, very well. We still miss those that are out from us, and we pray that they'll be returned in the very, very near future. Please guide and direct in all that is done. To you be the praise, the honor, and the glory given. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
this morning. How are you? We're sad. We're missing the other three, but they're a little under the weather this morning, but I'm glad you're here with me today. And we're going to have fun anyway. Is that cool? All right. So do you like surprises? I do too. I really like surprises. Well, you know, my family and I had a surprise uh, several weeks ago now. We had a little vine pop up out by the very end of our driveway, and we didn't know it was there. You know what was on that vine? I'm gonna show you. Look at that. <laughs> now, don't know how the vine got there. Maybe somebody threw out some pumpkins last year. Maybe we didn't, but suddenly we have this beautiful vine that has created uh, probably about 12 or 15 pumpkins now. And we have different colors. We have naughty ones. We have not naughty ones. Now, how did that happen? But it was a nice surprise because we've really enjoyed these pumpkins. Well, I want to share with you, pumpkins is kind of like what Jesus can do for us. Did you know that? When you pull a pumpkin off the vine, what do you think it's got on it? It comes from the ground, so what's it got on it? I heard somebody say it. Some dirt. Got some dirt on it, so we have to clean it off a little bit, right? Now, did you make a jack-o'-lantern at home? You did? So... You already did it? Okay, so you cut the top off, didn't you? And then what did you do? Do you remember? You took all the seeds out. That's exactly right, Ben. You took all that stuff that was in there inside the pumpkin out, didn't you? And did you carve a face on it? Scary. Scary. So it wasn't a smiley face? No. Well, if we carved a smiley face, that would be nice, wouldn't it? You made yours scary. That's, that's good, too, because it's Halloween, isn't it? Did you put a candle in it? You did? A different one? It's, oh, it goes around in a circle? That's really cool. You're going to have to take, me, take a picture of it for me so I can see it. So it's kind of like what Jesus does for us. He takes the dirt off and cleanses us, and he makes us nice and clean. And then he takes our tops off, and he gets all the bad seeds out and those bad feelings out, and he cleans us up really good. And then he puts his light inside of us so that we can shine for him. Isn't that amazing? So now next time you do a pumpkin, you can think about how Jesus is doing that for each and every one of us. Isn't that cool? You got two pumpkins? That's even better. I love it. That is great. Your grandpa helped you pick them? Well, grandpas are good for that. Yeah, mine are kind of small. But it's okay because good things come in small packages. So, and Jesus doesn't care if we're small like you or big like me. He'll still clean us out and put his light inside of us. So that's the wonderful thing about Jesus. All right, John 1, verses 3 and 4. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shineth in the darkness. So that's what Jesus can do for us, help us shine our light for him. All right? You want to be Open your Bible with me to Hebrews chapter 6, please. Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to do part 2 today 
of the message that we started last week, talking about God being our ever-present hope. I've added a word in the title for this week. God is our ever-present dependable hope. Dependable hope. We're going to read a few verses of Scripture from Hebrews chapter 6, starting with verse 13. In the context of this passage, the writer of Hebrews is talking about our great high priest that we have in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He actually starts that in verse 1 of chapter 6. Then he has a parenthesis that takes place in verses 11, or rather, should I say, verse, uh, yes, verse 11 down through uh, chapter 6, verse 12. I'm going back to chapter 5. Let me get myself straight right there. Uh, chapter 5 and following. <clears throat> In verse 13 of chapter 6, though, he resumes talking about our high priest, and these are his words. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We have an ever-present dependable hope. The writer of Hebrews knew that he had an ever-present, dependable hope. As I lead off this morning, I would say to us again, we've talked about the storms of life here in the month of October, and we're drawing this series to a conclusion. We'll try to finish it, the Lord willing, next Sunday. I hope you've gotten something out of it because there's no question about the fact that we all face storms in our life and we need a hope to sustain us in the midst of those storms. And that's what I've been trying to direct our attention to here in the last uh, couple of weeks, how we need to trust God, just like we were singing about this morning in the songs that Brother Larry had selected for us to sing, and they just tied in so well with the message. I really, really appreciate that. But we need a hope to sustain us as we live in this chaotic world. This is a dangerous time. I don't have to tell you that. You know it. We live in dangerous, dangerous times. The challenges that we face suggest that we have a need for something that we can uh, have some strength from. Where can we find that strength in a time like this that we are dealing with? And where can we find the strength that we need when the storm winds are really, really blowing in our own life and we're facing tremendous challenges? Paul in the New Testament points believers to a heavenly father whom he describes as the God of hope. And indeed he is. The God of hope, Romans 15, 13. The writers of the Old Testament also pointed people to God because they recognized that God was the only one in which mankind could find the help that he needed when the Times were difficult in one's life. 
The words were different in the Old Testament than in the, the New. We have the word hope, just like I've uh, read it to you from here in the sixth chapter of Hebrews. But in the Old Testament, there were words that were used like the word safety, the word security, the word trust, the word refuge. And there were other Hebrew words that were used that suggested that there was something out there that one was waiting for that they were looking forward to receiving with great anticipation. The Hebrew words all pointed in that direction, suggesting that one does indeed have hope in God, for he is the God of hope. What in the Old Testament was concealed in the New is revealed, so now in the New Testament we're able to read and understand that we have a blessed hope. We have God as our hope. We have the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we can place our faith and trust because he is our great high priest and boy, we can have a strong hope in him. A vital point for us to always remember, beloved, is that the source of a believer's hope is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we talked about last week from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. But there's a difference. The difference for those who were in the Old Testament period was that they were looking forward to that event that would occur at Calvary. For us today, we're looking back at that event because we know that the New Testament tells us it has already taken place, it's already occurred. So we place our faith and our trust in what Christ did for us at the cross, what the Bible tells us he did for us, and we go forward in hope, anticipating what is in store for us out there in the future, and we anticipate the meeting of our needs each and every day that we live. So hope is a present possession which every believer has. You know, I have keys in my possession this morning. I have a fob in my possession this morning. They've changed all the terminology, right? That won't do you any good unless you take it from me, and I'm not going to let you have it, <clears throat> because that gives me access to my car. That's my possession. I also have in my possession hope. It's mine. It's yours. It's a hope that is a present possession that you and I are blessed with to have in our lives and when we are facing stormy times in our lives and dangerous times like we are now, then we just hope and keep on hoping for God to do all that he has said that he would do. Today's text tells us that with hope we have a strong consolation. Verse 18, look at it again in the latter part who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. And because we have it, we have a strong consolation there about the middle part of verse number 18. So let's define those words so that we can increase our understanding. The word consolation there speaks of that which comforts. A strong consolation is that which comforts us in our lives. It brings comfort to our heart. For a believer, it is the peace and the joy that is imparted by the indwelling Holy Spirit who lives and abides in our hearts and lives each and every day as he replaces anxiety and fear with the comforting assurance of God's love and ultimate deliverance from the troublesome challenges that we face in this life. It's amazing. That's a work of grace, isn't it? It's amazing how that works out. And because I have the Holy Spirit abiding in me each and every day, 
He takes care of my anxieties and my fears whenever I give them to him. And he replaces that, those anxieties and those fears with the love of God because I know that I'm loved. He reminds me that I am loved. And then he also assures me that my hope is steadfast and certain because there will be a deliverance for me from all of these troublesome things that life brings. Hope is the second word, and I defined hope for you last week. Let me kind of define it again in some different words, and maybe it will make uh, more sense. I hope I didn't leave you confused last week. But hopefully with today's message coupled with what we shared last week, you will get the message and you will be able to clearly understand the hope that we have, it being an ever-present hope, a dependable hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So hope, remember, as defined, is a feeling that one believes will come to pass. It's something that we have been taught specifically in New Testament terminology. There's things that we have been taught that have not yet come to pass, but we are assured that they will. That's hope. That's hope. For example, I have been taught all my life that the day is going to come that we speak of as being the rapture. It has not occurred yet. I suppose that there's probably plenty of people out there in the world this morning who are saying, well, I've heard that all my life. It hasn't happened. I don't think it's going to happen. Where is the signs? Well, all you've got to do is look around and you see plenty of signs. And it hasn't happened yet in my 74 years, but it could very well happen before the sun sets today. And I believe it with all of my heart because Jesus said, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. He said he was coming and I absolutely believe it, don't you? With all of my heart, I believe he's coming again. Just because he hasn't come doesn't mean that he's not going to. He is coming. So that is a hope that I have. And that's the best illustration that I know how to give you of that hope. You see, for a believer, hope means that we have a trust or a reliance in the promises of God and his power to fulfill them. And he will bring them to pass in other words, it involves expecting God to do everything that he has promised that he will do. And I'm going to tell you something this morning, beloved, that I hope will encourage you. God will never fail to keep one of his promises. Not one time. I may make a promise and I may fail. Circumstances, situations, forgetfulness hate to admit it, but that could be the case, you know. You forget something that you've promised sometime, but God never forgets. God never fails. God will deliver all that he has promised. That is why the words of David in the Old Testament, in my opinion, are so poignant for us. In Psalm 42, 5, David speaks of, how we are to hope in God. Hope thou in God, he said. And he follows that up in Psalm 146 verse 5 by saying, Happy is he whose hope is in the Lord God. That's where we find happiness. The expectation that God is going to do everything that he has said he will do. So we easily conclude that through the Lord Jesus Christ we have a dependable, ever-present hope. But let's note a few more things about this hope that we have in the Lord very quickly this morning. Number one, Paul indicates that our ever-present hope is a dependable hope, 
And it's in a class that's all by itself. There is nothing in this world that compares with the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the writer of the Hebrews tells us it is a better hope in chapter 7, verse 19. A better hope. We might hope in a lot of things as it relates to this world and the culture that we are in. But there's no better hope than that that we have in Christ. It is a better hope. Paul told Titus in chapter 2 verse 13 that it is a blessed hope. I used that term a few minutes ago. It is a blessed hope because it's blessed for me to have that hope in my life today. And I can depend upon it even when things are not going good, even when the way is difficult, even whenever I'm living in the midst of a dangerous culture and a dangerous world like I'm living in today, I still have that blessed hope. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19, where we are here this morning, we find that it is a sure and steadfast hope. It is a hope that we can count on, depend on. It's steadfast. It's not going to be lost. It's not going to be destroyed. It's not going to be undermined. Its foundations will not be eroded. It is sure and it is steadfast for all eternity. Finally, Colossians chapter 1 verse 5, Paul says, It is a hope which is laid up for you in heaven. It's reserved on the other side for us. That tells me that it's a certain hope. I can depend upon it. Number two, the Bible gives us wonderful examples of those who expressed hope or who talked about hope. For example, Abraham, the first one that I give you, Paul records in Romans chapter 4, verse 18, this about Abraham, that he, against hope, believed in hope. Now, that's an interesting statement. Against hope, he believed in hope. You know what that means? May I suggest unto you that what it means is that he kept on hoping when there was no good reason for him to have hope. You see, the time for Sarah to bear a child was well past. Abraham knew that. Yet God had told him, he said, I'll bless your seed and your seed shall become as the sand of the sea. And Sarah continued to get older and older and older. So did Abraham. He continued to get older and older and older. And it seemed like the time had run out and there was no reason to have any hope at all that there would be a child born but Abraham, against hope, kept on hoping. And at the ripe age of 100, he had a son named Isaac, whom he named Isaac, I should say. When hope was gone, in other words, Abraham hoped on. Abraham hoped on. His faith did not waver. And that's that faith that he exercised in the Lord was what pleased God and uh, made God so happy. Your faith and my faith in him, even in the midst of adversity and difficulty, when it seems like there is no hope, we just need to hope on and continue to trust God and have faith in him. And it will make the Father smile, I do truly believe with all of my heart. David believed in hope as we have already talked about. I gave you a couple of verses of scripture in Psalm where he said, Hope thou in God, and happy is he whose hope is in the Lord. That leads me to believe that David was a man who had tremendous hope in God. He even talked of God as being his refuge. That was one of the words that I gave you a few minutes ago that points to this hope that we're talking about this morning coming to us from the Hebrew, the Hebrew words that were used for the translation of the Old Testament. David knew that God was his deliverer. He knew that God was his refuge. 
He was a man of hope. Thirdly, Solomon was a man of hope because he wisely said in Proverbs 13, 12, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Now we need to break that down and understand what it means, and I'll do it real quickly and very simply, hopefully, so that you can understand it. He is speaking to the fact here that when a soul continues to long for something to comfort it, but never finds it, the spirit grows faint and the heart experiences, if you will, a painful sickness because it's not been experienced. But I'm glad he didn't stop right there at the mid part of that. He went further. He went on by saying, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. So he is describing the case of those who search for hope outside of God and what he has provided through his son. And he looks forward to that which is expected. And for those that are in God and those who place their faith and their trust in God, it's different than for those that are outside of God. They don't have a hope. They don't have, as it were, a tree of life. But for those that are in God who are trusting Him and His ever-present dependable hope, then that becomes a tree of life when the expectation is fulfilled. One of these days, whenever the Lord steps out on the clouds, sounds the trump of God and calls us home, I suspect that there will be a shout that will be unbelievable because what we've expected and longed for will become, as it were, a tree of life that will excite us and thrill us as we go up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. When we experience all that the Lord has for us to experience out there in the future, in the eternal state, that's going to be like a tree of life. Overflowing in our hearts and in our lives as we experience the things that we have expected God to fulfill in our lives. I've read about heaven. I've studied about heaven. I've preached about heaven. But whenever I experience it in reality, wow. Wow. When my hope becomes sight and I see it in reality, it will be as it were a tree of life. Achieving the expectation that I have had and exceeding that expectation. That's what Solomon was talking about. Thirdly, there are some things we need to know about our ever-present dependable hope. I'm going to give you four real quickly. I won't take long. Number one, the purpose of our hope. Why do we need it? What's its purpose? Its purpose is to be a refuge, verse 18 of this passage. A strong consolation, he says, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. In other words, our hope protects us from danger and it gives us something to look forward to in the midst of the troubles and the troublesome times that we're experiencing in our lives. It's a refuge. Number two, the power of our hope. It's an anchor. Verse 19 says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. My hope in Christ is an anchor. It holds me in place and it makes me feel safe and secure. In the midst of storms that come in my life, there have been times when it seemed as if I was moving to the right, flowing back to the left just like a wave in the sea and I was drifting and you know probably what I'm talking about for you have had those experiences but with the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ 
We have an anchor for our soul and it is sure and it's steadfast and it keeps us on track. My recent days of being in the midst of sorrow and difficulty and so forth have found me depending upon the anchor of my soul. And that's my hope in Jesus. Thirdly, the place of our hope is God's sanctuary. Verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. That within the veil, that's a key word. For you see, the hope that we have in the Lord is a hope that lays claim to the very holies of holies in heaven where the remission of sin has taken place for every child of God because it was there that the Lord Jesus entered and placed his blood upon the mercy seat as an everlasting eternal sacrifice for sin for all who believe and receive him as their personal savior. It remains there today. It will remain there throughout eternity as the everlasting eternal sacrifice and the fulfillment of the sacrifice that God required and in its place in the holies of holies we are to worship in a place like this right here at Benham Baptist Church we are to worship our Heavenly Father worship him because our sins have been forgiven worship him because we have the expectation that he's going to come for us. Worship him. Worship him. Praise him. Give him glory. Fourthly, the person of our hope, verse 20 tells us, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, he entered into the holies of holies. He is our forerunner. A runner, he went there, placed his blood upon that altar, as I've already said, as the eternal sacrifice for our sin. And he himself has become our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Our hope is Jesus Christ, our high priest. You see... He completed the work of redemption for us, which fulfilled the promises of God that it would occur. Way back in the pages of time, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, was the first indication that it would take place. He completed it. His promises were based on two unchangeable things that the writer of Hebrews talks about here. Number one, the eternal agreement of the Godhead. Number two, the oath of God or his own word that Christ would come. And the writer of Hebrews says in verse 18, it was impossible for God to lie, so it had to happen. And it did happen. And that's why we have an ever-present, dependable hope today. Yes, beloved, God is our ever-present, dependable hope. I've used that term several times already, but I want you to take it home with you because I want you to find consolation using the word that's given in verse 18. I want you to find comfort by relying upon the fact when you're in the midst of your storm or storms, and we all have them, you'll have that consolation, that comfort that comes by relying upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day that we live, beloved, we need to remember some things. We need to remember that God is our hope in relation to life's burdens. We all have them, don't we? Burdens. We know what they are. We are burdened with personal anxieties we're burdened with family concerns. We're burdened with spiritual trials. We find ourselves burdened with sorrow when we lose our loved ones and our friends and our acquaintances. 
We are burdened with the general responsibilities of life. What do we do? We look to God. He is our hope. He is our hope in relation to those burdens. God is our hope in relation to life's perils. We face <clears throat> visible dangers sometimes. <clears throat> but we also face a lot of invisible dangers. There's a lot of dangers sometimes that are, that, that, that are surrounding us that we don't even know that's there. I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not. As we walk through this life and go from place to place and do the things that we do, there's risk to us each and every day. Risk. Potential risk. We could pick up some type of disease and not even know it. Think about COVID. I've often said about COVID that if I could see it on the surface like I do dust and I could wipe it off with disinfectant and so forth and know I got it cleaned up, I'd feel a whole lot better, but I can't. I can't. But I know it's out there. Rosalie and I were in a place yesterday and Bless her heart, Rosalie's had a whole lot of coughing here of late with the bronchitis and so forth that she's been dealing with. But we went in this place yesterday and there was a person sitting there and it was almost continually. And I'm thinking, Joe, where's the door? You need to get out of here. Because I recognized there was a risk. There was an invisible potential there in the air that could affect me by breathing in. And I, I knew that to be the case. What did I have to do? I had to depend upon God. I just had to trust Him. I had to place my hope in Him because He is my hope in relation to life's perils. Just one example of many. There's others that we could talk about, but time has run out. God is our hope in relation to life's end. He will walk through that journey with us. It's getting closer now. I realize it's getting closer, don't you? He'll walk with us. He'll deliver us from fear. He'll remove the sting of death. And He'll give complete victory over it through a transforming bodily resurrection. He is my hope. God is my hope in relation to life's end. God is your hope in relation to life's end. Daily we need to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, the Bible says. It brings us a strong consolation. It will be our insurance as we journey through life. It will establish a sure line of communication between us and our Heavenly Father. It will enable us to come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. God, my beloved friends, is our hope, our deliverer, and our salvation. Father, thank you for being my ever-present hope my dependable hope. I pray that your children have been encouraged and strengthened through this study and this message this morning. It is certainly very strengthening to me. Help us to realize that you're our hope. You are our hope in this life, period. Burdens, perils, dangers, invisible dangers, visible dangers, risk, storms, storm waves, storm winds, hurricane force sometimes, but you remain our steadfast hope. Help us to leave here having captured that fully in all of our hearts and our minds, or at least having it renewed 
because we may have formally captured it already. May we have our understanding renewed then so that we will be stronger in you in the days ahead. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, please. Thank you.